There's a time in July and August when I enter the sanctuary and the restored meadow is alive with swallowtails and goldfinches and house wrens, and it's humming with pollinators, bees and wasps and flies and butterflies. It's fabulous, and it just makes me stop and think this is possible. Many people find spiritual connection with nature and with the landscape that they're in. And so to see it treated poorly, to see it not have young trees that can come back and survive and thrive, to see the stream look beat up and battered hurts. And when we have an opportunity to do better, to really fix and restore nature, I think that's a gift that we give ourselves and that we give to the world. I do think about the past a lot, but we won't be restoring to the past. In the past, we had plants and animals that slowly developed very complex relationships. And we need to look to those relationships to know what could be possible for the future, even though the future will not be exactly like the past. What assemblages of plants worked well in this area. How close can we come to those assemblages to set the stage for something that can be successful in the future? Knowing that nature's going to take its own course. It is fall, and just shy of a westward jag in this twisting creek that connects downstream with the river Potawamki, the autumn air stings. The little ice age is at its most bitter this century, but the cold is also the reason the hunters have journeyed here. Native Americans no longer live in this land above the fall line. They emptied out of the region earlier in the century due to pressure from warring northern tribes. But every fall and winter, the Algonquians return. When food sources at their villages along the southern Potomac and Rappahannock are exhausted in autumn, they travel the short distance north to these forests. Here, they hunt turkey, elk, bear, and deer, all of them plump from an autumn mast of hickory nuts, beech nuts, and acorns. Even working these prolific hunting grounds, by the end of winter, the Algonquians will be noticeably thinner and happy to stay close to home near the southern Potomac, commencing a blessed six-month spree of oystering and fishing. In the Southland, they are also assured the 120 frost-free days needed to grow maize, and they are certain to find waterfowl. Each Algonquian tribe has made its home near marshes full of fowl geese, ducks, herons, and swans. In 1608, 7,000 Algonquians live here, along the southern Potomac, Rappahannock, and Patuxent, including the Piscataways on the east bank of the Potomac, Toxinants along a bay to the west, as far north as the Nakach tanks, on the south bank of the confluence of the Anacostia and Potomac rivers. We know the count, 7,000, because the colonists have arrived and made a count. This count will soon fall. At first, colonists struggled to survive on this land new to them in the southern Potomac. 
1640, they number just 450. But after 1650, the colonists' population increases sixfold within one generation. Crowd diseases such as smallpox now spread quickly from the colonists to the people of the Potomac nations. Colonists capitalize on illness, depleting the native populations, and push into the land of their Algonquian neighbors to plant more tobacco and corn and to extend pasture lands. The resulting land disputes end up in the court system of the colonists, where English law is wielded to dispossess the Potomac tribes of their land. Some indigenous people flee the region. Others move deep into marsh areas to get away from the colonists. Still others choose to stay and live on newly set aside lands on both the eastern and western shores of Maryland. And all the while, the epidemics rage on. By 1675, the population of the native people of the region has significantly declined. Those of European and African descent will come to vastly outnumber the indigenous people. But everywhere on this land, the Algonquians leave names behind. Monocacy, a garden. Patuxent, at the Little Rapids or Falls. Chesapeake, Great Shellfish Bay. Members of the last Algonquian tribe to hold an original settlement make a journey north in 1701 to sign a relocation treaty with William Penn. As they emigrated to Pennsylvania, they passed north of Colonel John Coates, who now owned these forests and hunting grounds just south of the westward jag in Rock Creek. Alan Brown is Audubon Naturalist Society's historian of Woodend. He is a leading expert on the Jones family, who owned this land for more than 150 years, and the Wells family that followed them. Recently, he visited a spring off Susanna Lane, steps away from Rock Creek Park, to tell the story of the Jones family and the Wells family that followed. Wow, this is a lot more overgrown than it was when I was here last, and this, this tree has fallen right here. But the old marker's still there. So this is Clean Drinking Spring, probably the last remnant of a land grant given to a man named Coates or Quartz in 1699 or so, and surveyed around from the spring and around. So, in order to get a land grant, first you measured out the meets and bounds, had a surveyor, somebody who could do arithmetic in that day and age, trigonometry, set out the meets and bounds, and you'd submit that along with some kind of a name. And the names could be pretty fanciful. They were like naming racehorses or boats or something. People would just think up a fancy name. And this one was named Clean Drinking. With the Algonquians dispossessed of their land, the old world's property system took root in the Chesapeake colonies. Clean drinking was a fief, a gift, from a noble to a favored and loyal citizen, from the ruling Calvert family to John Coates, planter and member of the Maryland Assembly. To Colonel John Coates, all that tract or parcel of land called Clean Drinking Spring, on the west side of a branch called Rock Creek Branch, beginning at a bounded red oak. The story is that the reason this was called clean drinking is that those surveyors who were out running the meets and bounds of clean drinking ran out of whatever alcoholic beverage was fueling them on their survey. And when they got back here, they were forced to drink clean. And a poem exists explaining that. It goes, they broke their bottles at the spring with a will and the name clean drinking clings to it still. But I always took that to mean they did it strongly. That was the, with a will. In 1747, this spring-fed Maryland land came down by marriage to Charles Jones, judge and farmer, signer of a repudiation of the British Stamp Act of 1765. It was Charles, his children and grandchildren, who set out to tame the wild-looking but ecologically balanced forest land of clean drinking into a partially flattened landscape suitable for crops and livestock that would earn pounds and shillings for the family. And they did it, at least at first, 
with the crop that made this far-flung colony, then brand new nation, rich, but which came at the highest price. To grow a crop like tobacco is extremely labor intensive. Prior to growing a lot of tobacco in Maryland, there were relatively few enslaved people in Maryland. But in order to develop a cash crop, a lot more had to be imported. And so the port of Bladensburg, which was the second largest port in America for a period of time in the 1800s, saw the, the export of a lot of tobacco and the import of a lot of enslaved people from Africa. And so that's, you, you know, that's a wearing out of people. Um, to turn them to the work of producing a cash crop that's not for food. It's an exhausting, very, very labor-intensive crop. In this system, this relatively new system that was being promulgated in, in the United States or in the early English colonies and later in the United States, there was an idea that enslaved Africans and whoever else got caught, caught up in that net, that they were chattel. They called it chattel slavery, like cattle, and that their only use and their only importance was to take things out of the land, to provide service to those who, for some reason, and they decided that it was because God so ordained, um, they had to be served. Well, enslaved communities of Africans and their descendants saw themselves generally in a very different way. Their ideas of land were land as mother, land as source, land uh, to be reverenced, to be honored. Land was not to be used and squeezed. The idea of using land only for cash is like using a person only for what it can, they can give you. Indigenous people had been displaced from the land, and African-born and African-descended people increasingly yoked to it. The land itself suffered when it was used for profit-driven monoculture. Tobacco changed the land of Woodend with a force before only summoned by eons of time. And it, even though it was very short-lived, it had really profound impacts on the land, um, primarily on our soils. All of the rich, dark, hummusy topsoil that would have been produced by forests were stripped from the land with the tobacco farming and transported down to our streams. And a lot of that really wonderful soil is now in the Chesapeake Bay. It's a huge parts of the East Coast, anywhere where you saw this kind of large scale farming, the stream valleys over time were filled with what's called legacy sediment, which is typically the finer particles of soil that moved there downstream from the places where the forests were all cut and then the soil became loosened. So we, we have that here. We have legacy sediments in our stream valleys. It means that our stream banks are not very stable and that they continue to erode. There were a lot of bankruptcies among people who grew tobacco. Some certainly made out well, sold at the right time, something like that, but others uh, suffered bankruptcies. Overwhelmed by thinning topsoil and rampant pest problems, battered by wild price swings, the Jones family closed their three tobacco barns located northwest of the Clean Drinking Manor House. The Joneses turned to corn and wheat and milling. At the time, prominent families were building mills throughout the county making the same agricultural transition. For the Joneses, the attempt to gain agricultural stability from grain production was short-lived. The mill vanishes from all written accounts after 1837. We know little of the Joneses' relationship to their land, but may get a sense of it from the annotated almanacs of their neighbor, Dr. William Palmer of Sandy Spring. In Palmer's almanacs, we can observe an early 19th century Montgomery County farmer's careful attention to the forces of nature. Writing between 1818 and 1848, Palmer, a physician, farmer, and holder of enslaved persons, kept strict daily records of morning and evening temperatures and other weather conditions, noted the still raging epidemics sweeping the country, and monitored the state of the Potomac and Susquehanna rivers, both prime transportation routes. It was advances in transportation, coupled with a location just outside a major American city, that would suddenly change the land at clean drinking and draw it into the modern age. 
horse-drawn streetcars on rails, able to reach a speed of nine miles per hour, took Washington, D.C. by storm in 1862. Then in the 1890s, the trolley car arrived, named for the way its cable to electrical power resembled a line of a fishing trawler. Trolleys could go 25 miles per hour, and suddenly, people could work in the city and live in the country. The Chevy Chase Land Company completed the trolley line along Connecticut Avenue in 1892. Sales were initially slow in Chevy Chase, Washington, D.C.'s first trolley suburb, but marketers scored big with a new feature targeted at federal workers, a single-family home with a yard. In Chevy Chase, nature and man have combined their efforts with charming results. Nearby, an independent businessman, Harry Martin, marketed parcels of land based on their proximity to Chevy Chase. In both Chevy Chase and nearby Martin's edition, one other feature was exclusivity, based on race and religious discrimination covenants that mirrored the widespread racism and anti-Semitism of the age. That the property hereby conveyed, either before or after the improvements are made, cannot be sold, rented, leased, or otherwise placed in the possession of a colored man or one of the African race. This period of, of development is part of a larger period of, of difficulty, of extreme difficulty for African Americans in the United States. Historian Rayford Logan called this the nadir uh, of African American experience in the United States. Not only are African Americans being, being excluded from a wonderful form of life, but those who are doing the exclusion are cutting off parts of themselves. This racism, this racism, and the infection of people who are born innocent, they should not, this is not, this doesn't belong to anyone. Not only affected African Americans, but infected European Americans. Along Jones Mill Road, the land of clean drinking was not close enough to the Connecticut Avenue trolley to be acquired in the first wave of commuter development. But with a higher elevation than that of Washington, land farther out into Montgomery County became desirable for Washington's burgeoning white upper class as a place to build mighty estates and escape from D.C.'s oppressive summers. By 1896, the Jones family inhabitants of Clean Drinking Manor had dwindled to one lone soul, Nicholas Jones. Jones eked out a modest living, teaching art, dredging sand from Rock Creek, and renting land to tenant farmers. A few miles to the south, however, denizens of the maturing capital city showcased their swelling wealth in gilded age high style. One garish fashion was contributing to the decimation of birds throughout the country. Many birds had been overhunted for food and for sport throughout the 1800s. But now birds were being hunted in massive numbers for yet another motivation, to adorn women's hats. One style even consisted of the entire bird. It was the demands of a women's fashion which had elevated the threat to birds. And now it was women who would call critical attention to the issue and drive the movement for bird protection. Regional Audubon societies began to spring up in the East in order to raise awareness and protect all birds. In 1897, Florence Miriam Bailey and others organized the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia, which would later become the Audubon Naturalist Society. Bailey was an ardent bird conservationist who, in 1890, wrote one of the first illustrated field guides, Birds Through an Opera Glass. The regional Audubon societies were able to create greater public awareness, and the first federal legislation to protect birds was passed. The Lacey Act of 1900 prohibited interstate transport of poached birds and game. The Migratory Bird Act went even further, making it unlawful to collect birds or bird parts, including feathers. President Theodore Roosevelt was a member of the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia, and as president, he would place 230 million acres of U.S. land under federal protection. 
Later in the 20th century, the story of the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia would continue on in Chevy Chase, Maryland, on the land that was once known by the name Clean Drinking Manor. The story of this plot of land would begin a new chapter with the death of Nicholas Jones in 1911. The land sold five years later to a young and upcoming couple, Marion and Chester Wells. Soon would begin the era of their grand manor, Woodend. This nursing home on the corner of Jones Bridge and Jones Mill Road sits where the old house, the 1750 Clean Drinking Manor sat, that was the home of the Joneses into the teens of the 20th century, after which the Wells bought the property. In fact, the Wells were considering building their house right on the footprint of Clean Drinking Manor. But I think the Wellses were wise to build up on the hill behind where their house actually is today. Again, the land would change. The scattered forests and farmland of clean drinking were transformed into a 20th century gardened estate, complete with a Georgian revival mansion at the top of a gently sloping hill. The estate's owner, Marion Wells, had a love for birds that would grow so strong over her lifetime that she would one day, in an act of astonishing generosity, link the land of Woodend to the future of a renowned environmental group with a history in bird conservation the Audubon Naturalist Society. Marion Wells was the daughter of an Australian tobacco magnate. She grew up outside Sydney on a vast estate named Abergeld, where numerous gardens sparked her lifelong interest in the natural world. Marion and her husband, Chester Wells, an American naval officer, began to purchase adjacent land parcels in preparation for creating their 110-acre estate, which they would name Woodend after the resort where they spent their honeymoon. So here we are at the top of the hill where the Wells actually did build their house. In 1928, they had John Russell Pope, the preeminent neoclassical architect of the period, build this house. By 1927, he had already designed the Scottish Rite Temple in Washington, D.C. And although he was the preeminent architect, Mrs. Wells, said to have been a very strong-willed woman, wanted him to kind of audition before he built the house. So she had him build the five-car garage down at the base of the driveway. And once he'd done that satisfactorily, she let him build the house. So what we have here is sort of classical for the period. It looks like an 18th century house. And that was popular in 1927. This was actually the automobile age. So the house was built at a time when you needed a driveway. We have an a long driveway giving us selected views of the house as we drive up. After the completion of Woodend, Pope went on a 10-year streak unequaled in the history of American architecture. Constitution Hall, the National Archives Building, the National Gallery of Art, the Jefferson Memorial. The six original blueprints for Woodend are stored at the National Gallery of Art. Let's go on up to the veranda. Up here. The veranda offered the Wells an unceasing look at wildlife just outside their bedroom windows. So here we are facing east on the open veranda. In a 1998 letter, one of the daughters of the Wells writes that the Wells kept a table up here for feeding birds, robins and cardinals and blackbirds. Imagine a bird feeder up here on the veranda. I wouldn't mind a veranda like this myself. Greenhouse, rose bushes, a goldfish pond, a hemlock grove with not one leaf out of place. Marion Wells and her gardener wasted no time in shaping Woodend into the type of manicured estate she knew from childhood. The 1927 Fuller Company construction photo of this house under construction shows a post-agricultural landscape pretty much devoid of plants and trees. And this 1937 Bjorn Edgeley painting shows the same landscape, this time with manicured lawns and planted trees. In 1932, a Post reporter walked across these lawns and left us a poetic description of what she saw. June 12, 1932, 
old manor and Chevy Chase gains in beauty with age. You are viewing part of one of the most magnificent estates in this vicinity, that of Captain and Mrs. Chester Wells, the old-fashioned garden with its roses and vines, lilacs and other plants and shrubs run riot, makes the site quaintly picturesque amidst its setting of tall cedars, locusts, and hemlocks. From the top of the hill near the manse are to be seen in the forest many dogwood trees. At the foot of the huge Kentucky bluegrass lawn, which forms a sloping hill around the mansion, I was shown a path which I followed. I came to a stream, its clear waters trickling along for a thousand feet, where it ended in a lovely natural pond. And the land stayed that way, gardened and manicured for the next four decades, in the manner of a big country house with formal gardens. Lawrence Johnson, the son of the Wells groundskeeper, Eddie Johnson, recalled seeing rabbits, raccoons, possums, foxes, and even muskrats at Wood End during this time. And for some years, Wood End maintained the features of a small working farm. There was a barn, a workhorse, a donkey. At the corner of Jones Mill Road and Jones Bridge Road, an apple orchard was planted, and 10 acres of potatoes were worked across Briarley Road. But these and other parcels began to be sold off for financial reasons, resulting from the Great Depression and World War II. 110 acres became 40, and the era of agriculture on the land came to a close. The land sold off by the wells was valuable real estate, and quickly became lots for dozens of new homes. Meanwhile, on the estate itself, Mrs. Wells' love for birds was growing. She became a member of the Audubon Naturalist Society of the Central Atlantic States. Its members in these decades included many of the environmental movement's greatest icons, including Roger Tory Peterson and Rachel Carson. The group's president, Erston Barnes, and Mrs. Wells became friends. When Mrs. Wells passed away in 1967, she left Wood End to the Audubon Naturalist Society to serve as its headquarters and as a bird sanctuary. This land with so much history had changed form yet again, from a private sanctuary to a public one. Well, there was no official opening day. But there was no ceremony, no coverage of that at all. We just started running programs and people started coming. Jerry Schneider was the first executive director of the Audubon Naturalist Society after the transfer of Wood End. He describes the appearance of the sanctuary at the time. The property hadn't been used for quite a while and things were overgrowing. The fields which are to our left mostly had multiflora rows and uh, all kinds of weeds. They had the conifers, some hardwoods, a mixed brush, but the field and the meadows was all, just all over the place. The new executive director was eager to institute an educational program right away, using the incredible natural resources suddenly at the disposal of the Audubon Naturalist Society. I was very impressed with the fact that we had these 40 acres in a residential area, and it was zoned for residents. I had never seen anything like that and thought to myself, fantastic. Few photographs of the sanctuary exist from this era, but photographs from a feature story for National Parks and Conservation magazine in June 1970 show Wood End being used to expand access to nature for school children from Washington, D.C. It was a start of realizing that here you had a property inside the Beltway, a residential property, but which would be a nature center or an environmental center, and you had right in close to the metropolitan area where you could have city kids interact. Kids who never even saw a grasshopper. But it's nice to see some original trees that are still here from the time I came here in 1969 to open up the property. It's, uh, it's really nice. I really like it. Generations of naturalists and conservationists of hikers and summer campers and preschoolers cherished the property too. But even the protected land of a nature sanctuary is not immune from change. In the next decades, the land was affected by factors within and without. 
just 300 years removed from the quiet woods plied by the occasional Algonquian hunting party. The world now moved at breakneck speed. These were decades of continued change and increased pressure on the landscape and its wildlife. Non-native species like this honeysuckle, imported to the United States by gardeners, or the stilt grass in this field, brought into the U.S. in commercial packing material, are species that enter a new environment and thrive, crowding out native species. At Wood End and throughout the Mid-Atlantic, invasive species have taken over at increasing speed, affecting countless acres. Of course, plants and animals have moved around the globe forever, but the difference is how quickly these changes are happening in a way that um, doesn't allow for a whole community structure to change and evolve together, but sort of overwhelms that system very rapidly with these new introductions. The seeds of non-native plants can be carried by wind or transported by birds. They can also be planted by humans. During a period when less was known about the damage to native ecosystems caused by invasives, both Mrs. Wells and the Audubon Naturalist Society planted non-native species on the property. Magnolia X solangiana, Sorsa magnolia, Acer palmatum, Japanese maple. Eliagnus umbellata, autumn olive, Onisera macchiai, Amor honeysuckle, Rosa multiflora, multiflora rose. Native species dwindled under pressure from invasive species, changing the land once again. Warmer temperatures and increasingly powerful storms are already being felt at Wood End, with effects on the land and on wildlife. We've been having stranger temperature shifts, and so sometimes things are sort of out of sync, right? So a plant will bloom, for example, in response to a warm spell before there's a pollinator um, available to pollinate. What we see is stressors on plants that might not otherwise have been stressed. And an example is our hemlock grove, where uh, couples like to get married. Our temperatures are going up, our trees are getting older, and that temperature increase is stressing the trees. The storms in our region have gotten more concentrated and more intense than they used to be by a lot. So what that means is that we might get somewhat more water than we used to, but what we really have is longer droughts and then followed by bigger storms. And that is a recipe for flooding because when the soil dries out, it actually loses some of its absorptive capacity. It's more like pavement, in fact. So when you've got really dry soil, then you've got this really intense storm. The water's gonna hit that dry soil and whoosh as though it was pavement into the streams. So the, the, all the harms that come to streams uh, and, uh, and natural landscapes because of stormwater are just gonna be increasing in magnitude and that, that's just a fact. And the harm to streams from stormwater runoff was already at a critical point because of development in the county, which had exploded in the mid 20th century and essentially never slowed. What that meant is that there were far fewer trees and that more and more of the county was paved. When you take the, the surface, which again, historically in our region, pre-colonization was very, very, very forested. A forested soil has deep roots that go through it, it has animals that burrow in it, has a lot of bacteria in the soil that are constantly decomposing the leaves and other organic matter that falls and dies there. And all of that activity makes the soil very spongy. It soaks up a lot of water. When we pave it instead, first when we cut the trees, the activity of the trees is lost. And then second, when we pave it, we take away that whole capacity. It's like you have a sponge and you just wrap it in plastic wrap. No more is the sponge useful to you at all. It's interesting to watch our region develop. We have lots of people who want to come to the DC metro region to live and work. And, and in response to that demand, we are developing at a very rapid rate. I think we all feel it. But one of the things that's hard for humans to feel is the pressure that that puts on wildlife. When you think about um, wildlife traveling, whether they're migrating or just moving through their territory, they really need contiguous green space. And as we develop, we chop up 
that green space. We make breaks between forests. We interrupt streams and put them underground. And all of that puts pressure on wildlife because it reduces their places to rest and refuel by eating. It cuts the number of spots they have to raise their young safely. But there was one wildlife species that thrived in the suburbs, an herbivore. It was ravenous and increasingly omnipresent. Cute, but hungry. In the edge habitat of the suburbs, it had more to eat with fewer predators than it had had at any time in ecological history, at numbers 40 times higher than the land could withstand. Deer stormed Woodend like a multi-hooved lawnmower. as they move through a system, they leave more exotic plants in place than natives. And they also love young plants that are tender. So the situation here at Wood End that's most dire is that we don't have young trees in the forest. So I'm about five feet tall and I can walk through the woods here and all the green will be right about at the top of my head because the deer can reach that high and have eaten everything that there is that they can eat below that level. So that's what we call the browse line. Five feet. <laughs> It's not a surprise that when we surveyed our members about their most important hopes for Woodend, that restoration of the habitats was top on their list. Our members love nature, and protecting nature right here at our headquarters was a priority for them. I think that there are two inspiration points that told us that a full-fledged restoration of Woodend was possible and could be fabulous. The first was the creation of the Blair Native Plant Garden. The garden depicts the physiographic regions of Maryland. That means that it has native plants from our mountains, from our plains, and from our coast. We had to fence it to protect it from the deer, but it became lush and beautiful so quickly. That garden was followed by a meadow restoration project, and that project was something. It required us to plant 3,000 plants by hand and to plant thousands of seeds by hand to try to bring back the biodiversity that had existed in the meadows at Woodend in the past and provided excellent bird habitat. And between the Blair Native Plant Garden and the Restored Meadow, I think we all could begin to see what was possible for all of Woodend Sanctuary. With a vision for the future, a 50-year master plan for the restoration of Woodend was approved. Forest, stream, pond, and meadow restoration. A wheelchair-accessible nature trail so that people of all abilities can immerse themselves in the habitats of Woodend and benefit from the healing powers of nature a nature play space where young children and their families, students and their teachers can unplug and play and establish a lifelong love of nature, the essential ingredient for growing a new generation of conservationists and environmental stewards, an upgrade of the Wood End building itself to create better, more effective classroom space for environmental classes, programs, and conferences. A restoration grounded in the long history of the land both the long stretch of time when ecosystems were at their healthiest, as well as the recent centuries when humans made impacts which were often destructive. A restoration that will focus on re-establishing a broad range of wildlife so that Woodend can serve as a green inspiration for the region as a whole.
demonstrating best environmental practices that will build resilience for the future in a rapidly warming world. The existing fence surrounding the Wood End Sanctuary was in no shape to exclude deer. After working closely with regional restoration experts, work commenced on a taller fence, one that would blend more fully into the landscape. It's exciting, it's a little bit nerve-wracking. You know, you feel like you've prepared for every eventuality, um, but now that it's here, things pop up that you think, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think about where the big pile of dirt was gonna go? Because in your mind, you were picturing just the finished product and not the process. So, um, so while we thought of lots of things, there are plenty more that we're sort of dealing with in the moment. Uh, but this is a classic example of you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. Work continued at a rapid pace. In the sanctuary's northwest corner, bamboo, which had completely taken over the area, was removed. Along the north border, a team of volunteers planted the first trees of the restoration. This corner over here where you see that tree house. In the coming years, thousands more trees will be added. And on a snowy day in December, over 100 volunteers and staff joined together to form a line across the property and humanely walk the deer out through an exit gate in the east fence. Two thousand eighteen was a year of great progress in the restoration. Trees arrived by truckload to provide habitat for wildlife, roots to stabilize the soil and soak up water, and shade for sanctuary goers. Generous and visionary donors made all the restoration work possible. It's really individual donors who have made these transformational differences. The Blair Native Plant Garden was supported by a family. The Meadow Restoration, supported entirely by an individual. The Master Plan, funded by one person. The Deer Fence, funded by dozens. It's all of those individuals who decided that what we're working on here is worthy and is important that enabled us to begin these very first steps to restoration of Wood End for the next 50 years. Volunteers formed the backbone of the expanding restoration. Oh, whoopee! Hi there, guys, how are you doing? This is your new home. <laughs> Donating thousands of hours and many skills in the environmental sciences. By July, after months of reduced deer pressure, a change could be detected along the forest floor. That's really exciting. You can still sort of see if you look through the forest, that five foot line. But we are starting to see some signs of recovery. If you look down on the forest floor, there are some things growing like this jump seed. But the other thing I'm excited about is the recovery of some of our spice bush. So here is a mature spice bush that had been browsed and was really not doing all that well. And it sent up these suckers. And every year our spice bush would do that, but every year they would get browsed. But this year they're recovering and we have almost these little mini spice bush. There are several things this year that I'm seeing on the forest floor that we did not see last year. This is a plant called clustered snake root. This is another forest floor species. These are exciting leaves because this is a plant called jack in the pulpit. It's a very typical forest floor species, so that's great. And we do hope that the forest itself, the more energy we put in at this early stage, the forest itself will hopefully recover its own natural processes and be able to take care of itself more. The restoration stormwater management component started in earnest with the installation of two rain gardens. We couldn't even really contemplate that first rain garden the tree safe rain garden until we knew that there would be a plan to remove some of the deer pressure because we knew we were planting it with more trees, more native plants, and that uh, with the number of deer we had on campus at the time that we started construction, um, it would be unsustainable. We'd have to leave it fenced forever. 
So that was definitely a part of the restoration and leaned on plans for the rest of the restoration in order to get it started. So parts of the restoration are to restore what's already here, the forest and the meadow. Um, we're by planting more native plants, by removing the deer pressure so that the native plants can return back. But it's also to go further and manage our stormwater. So we have a goal in our master plan to treat 100% of our stormwater runoff here on site. And with more frequent, intense storms, managing stormwater runoff is an essential strategy to build climate resilience, reduce flooding, and cut down on pollution flowing into Rock Creek, the Potomac, and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay. The stream restoration is another key stormwater management strategy. We are um, in the design phase of something that's called a step pool stormwater conveyance. We'll construct a series of weirs and we'll be using some log material and some stone material that we'll have to bring in from outside. And rather than rushing through the whole stream, the water will now encounter these weirs and form a series of pools and drops. Instead of uh, removing material until we get back to the floodplain, we're actually going to be raising the stream up to the level of the current floodplain. So we're going to be filling in the stream using materials like more boulders and gravel and cobblestones and sand and soil, which will allow the, the stream to be shallower, but we're not gonna be cutting back the banks and we're not gonna be cutting back the trees on the banks. The 45 small dams, known as weirs, will form a series of small pools and waterfalls along the length of the stream that will slow down the water and create excellent habitat for irises, sedges, frogs, salamanders, birds, and other wildlife. The restored stream, pond, and rain gardens at Woodend will increase the educational opportunities available to all visitors. Another key climate resilience strategy built into the Woodend Master Plan is restoration of biodiversity throughout the sanctuary. A wider range of species in our forest, meadow, and wetland plant communities will attract a greater diversity of birds, insects, small mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. A biodiverse Woodend will provide an essential resting, nesting, and refueling station for wildlife in our region wildlife that is increasingly stressed by climate change and urbanization. Restoring the land at Woodend includes renewing the relationship of humans to it. As a result of rapid development, the natural world has suffered enormous losses. At the same time, modern life has impaired our connection to nature. The restoration of Woodend offers an opportunity to begin to repair nature in the region, but also to restore our personal relationship to it. The new Nature for All movement is an essential component of the restoration of Woodend. Nature for All promises to demonstrate best practices for healthy habitats for people and wildlife. To do so, Nature for All will engage the expertise, experiences, and imaginations of a greater diversity of people in our region. The goal? To position ANS's mission work as an inspiration for the restoration of ecological health for all people and wildlife throughout the region itself. Our signature conferences, Taking Nature Black and Naturally Latinos, are opening wide the possibilities of connecting with more diverse groups of people. Como diría mi abuela, bienvenidos a su casa. Like my grandmother would say, welcome to your home. We want you to feel welcome in this space. Because all people have a history of strong connections to nature, Nature for All is committed to renewing and strengthening those connections. Nature for All gives us the opportunity to explore and celebrate the environmental leadership of people of color throughout our history, such as African Americans, who carried their knowledge of how to produce food, create medicine, and find spiritual healing on the land over generations. People like George Washington Carver, a scientist, environmentalist, inventor, and agricultural pioneer. I love to think of nature 
as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. George Washington Carver. We love community. And, we and to, to explore and celebrate modern day environmental champions such as Sokobi Wilson. We're literally the bodies of folks who live in those communities use their sinks for pollution. Tracy Lloyd McCurdy. Um, ancestors understood that by creating the commons. And Fred Tutman. From our work. In fact, we have yet to find a serious environmental problem in our watershed that it was not forged from some form of power imbalance or injustice. Americans whose families hail from Puerto Rico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, and beyond now live in the D.C. metro region in greater numbers than ever before. They came to this country bringing rich and diverse environmental backgrounds and have carried their environmental knowledge across hundreds of miles and through challenging cultural terrain. Not only is it good for the environment, but it's also good for myself. Nature for All adds new voices, viewpoints, and experiences to the work of Audubon Naturalist Society. I was scared and terrified. And I pray that I always had the right words to make people understand what we were about to face before the hurricane. It builds relationships, removes barriers, and creates pathways for environmental engagement with new audiences and new generations. And most importantly, Nature for All creates a healthy community for people and wildlife on the land that we know today as Woodend. If we want our future generations to love and protect nature, they need to have a personal relationship with it. And Woodend is a place where all people can develop that personal relationship with nature. We're not talking about disadvantaged people. Disadvantaged seems to be code for people of color, for poor people. I have seen people suffering from having too much. We're talking about all people. All of us together can have the power to make change. So what we have to do is develop the best living conditions we can of people interacting with nature so that we get the best of both. The best of living conditions for people and their requirements and the best for nature and the realization that both are needed to have the maximum good life. One of the species I think of as um, a harbinger of the restoration of Woodend is the eastern towhee. It is a ground lover. It loves to be on the ground, to feed on the ground. And it used to abound here at Woodend. A dime a dozen was the towhee. We rarely see them here. They're certainly not nesting. They're not feeding here at Woodend. And I would love to bring back the towhee so that we could know that we successfully restored our understory. I have this dream of Woodend serving as an arc for the region, that as other green spaces and neighborhoods are ready to begin to support wildlife and to repopulate with species that will help birds, will help butterflies, will bring back pollinators, that we can use the species that we're growing here at Woodend to serve those communities, to give them seeds, to give them plants, to be examples of what thrives and what will thrive for the future. That's really important to me, that Woodend isn't just an island unto itself, but that it is a leader and a provider for this idea of a green necklace that would surround the DC metro region in support of wildlife. 98.8 for conductivity. For yeah. me, I think I'm most excited about the forest restoration uh, because I think it's going to make the most dramatic difference in the way visitors experience the sanctuary. The biggest value that a restored wooden means to me is to show how we are walking the talk. We have for many years pushed all of our jurisdictions around this region to do a better job on their stormwater management. We've pushed them to preserve forests and green spaces and we are now using this opportunity to make sure that we do all that ourselves as we've always wanted to. And we'll continue to just do a better and better and better job of it into the future. So that's what I'm most excited about, so that our home base really will reflect our values um, that we've never strayed from and uh, will allow us to communicate those values in a new way, in a really physical, very present way. I'm not sure New York is hairy. How, how is that? 
New York. So our meadow team comes out here once a week. We do a survey of what's blooming in the meadow. We have four different quadrants that we look at. So we identify the individual types of plants that are blooming in each quadrant. Now there's the rough stemmed. Okay, that was one of the ones we were thinking about. And, and the leaves look like that. I'm thinking rough stemmed. Okay, yay. And then after we finish that, then we move into the clipping phase and we clip out as many of the invasive vines as we can. And that includes porcelain berry, multiflora rose, bindweed, um, and honeysuckle. True dedication to our calling here, we get covered with the seeds from the uh, tick trefoil. When we talk at Woodend about restoration, we talk about restoring to the future. A big part of that is that we don't want people to think that the restoration means it's going to look exactly the way it did in some past, because for one thing, the past of this landscape has changed in many different times and places. If you say the past, do you mean the past pre-human? Do you mean the past pre-colonial history? Pre-tobacco? Post-tobacco? You know, what do you mean by the past? So instead of trying to pick one particular time in the past that we would restore to, we're not. We're restoring to a vision of the future where we imagine a community of native plants and animals that thrive here together, a large diversity, many numbers of species, a place that's accessible to people, no matter who they may be or what, uh, what, what help they may need to access nature. This land here that Woodend occupies has had many different lives. And in order for us to think about the future of Woodend, we need to think about how do people interact with nature around them. We want people to be here, to be immersed in nature, to feel the benefits and to feel the inspiration of being in nature. And that human impact, that human interaction is really essential to the future of Woodend Sanctuary. We're mostly outside and outdoors and, and we always do fun activities. My friend, she is trying to catch a frog. How do we welcome people? How do we connect them with nature? How do we inspire them to care for nature in their own communities? So here at Woodend, we have a lot of decisions to make. Um, the first ones are gonna be easy, kind of like the, the low-hanging fruit. We know we have to get rid of the honeysuckle. It's spread all throughout the forest. It's um, impacting the ability of anything else to grow and germinate on the forest floor. So that's an easy one. But then, you know, next will be double file viburnum. We have four or five native viburnum species. This one is not native. After that, we'll have to think about the Japanese maples. Everybody loves the look of them in the fall, um, but they are spreading throughout the woods. And here at Woodend, our decisions are gonna be based on ecosystem function. What we're gonna do is create the most ecosystem function we can with what we have at hand. What we can do is set the conditions. What we can do is set a trajectory, but the end product is going to be determined by forces that we couldn't possibly control and harness precisely. Ooh, I think it's going to be so fascinating. First of all, I don't think we know everything that's going to happen. We think about the things that we will actively participate in restoring, but Mother Nature has a mind of her own, and she will be doing healing work throughout the sanctuary over the next 50 years. For the next 50 years, I think not only will Woodend be our living laboratory, where we teach people about the importance of supporting wildlife in our region, and we teach them how to do it in their own communities, I also think that it will be a beacon for thought and conversation around the future of our ecology here in the DC metro region. In particular, I think that Audubon Natural Society has a chance to convene leaders to think about these difficult questions. What does it mean to restore when we have climate change afoot? How do we create a green necklace that supports all wildlife when we are urbanizing at this rapid rate? And I think ANS becomes the thought leader and the convener in the region where these difficult and challenging problems can be analyzed, discussed, debated, and ultimately solved by working together. And I look forward to us being the leaders of that 
investigation and that discussion and those solutions. To join a volunteer team or to donate to the restoration, visit anshome.org slash restoration. To contribute to Nature for All, visit anshome.org slash donate.